Good morning. <laughs> I love it. We love to chat. That's a good thing. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Brittany, this is Melinda, and we'll be reading our scripture for today out of Psalm 145. Um, we do have a couple places where we'd love to invite you guys to read with us, so I'll prompt you when it's time. But if you could all stand for the reading as well, if you're able to. Psalm 145, a song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. And join in with us now. The Lord, the Lord is, is gracious, gracious and, and merciful. merciful slow, slow to, to anger, anger and, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord, the Lord is good to all, and his, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Oh, now it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cue you for the last, you're on for the last verse. <laughs> all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his, works and in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him and all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who know him, all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Join us now. My, My mouth will speak, speak the praise of the Lord and let, and let all the flesh bless, bless his, his holy name forever and ever. and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Can we give these ladies a hand? Thank you for leading the herding the cats. That cat herding is not easy. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Brittany. It was so much, so much fun to hear that. We loved the, um, the multi-generational aspect and thought that would be a fun element to be able to bring in in the reading this morning as we look at Psalm 145. We're in a conversation about wisdom literature, how it is that in the middle of our Bible, God gives us tools and equips us for the, the stuff that happens in the middle of our life. And, and this morning we're in Psalm 145 to talk about something that I've realized in the last week or two, or actually the last several weeks, I needed more than I realized I actually needed it. A whole bunch of us have been walking through, uh, having some fun on Wednesday nights, going through the relentless elimination of hurry. And we've done that kind of in different ways, many of us, and we, want, would, we would even invite you to our last week. It's coming up this Wednesday because we've created a drop-in mechanism. So some of you heard about it. It's like, hey, I'll show up. It'll be great. And by the way, we're having ice cream this, this week from Cali Cream. So there is that. Don't tell the students, all right? Yeah, because they will be here, so we're telling the students that the ice cream will be available at 11.30 p.m. so that all the rest of us will get it, right? Because you know the vultures will swoop. But anyway, I digress. So, so we're getting together on this Wednesday night. We're doing a relentless elimination of hurry. Some of us have read the book. Some of us, some of us have read the book multiple times from some of you. That's pretty, pretty impressive. Workbook, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that dawned on me in the relentless elimination of hurry processing um, over the last several weeks is that I've realized how challenging it is to remember God. Now, you would think, bro, like, isn't this kind of your day job? <laughs> you know? So, like, what, what, are you, what are you talking? Well, here, here's where I kind of get, get with me a little bit. That, that in that relentless elimination of hurry, I find, maybe you find this as well, that there is a velocity to life. 
that never ends. And I find that oftentimes, that velocity in, in my life, with particularly with like needs and prayer requests, things that I really care about and I'm concerned. So something will come across my desk, something will come across my text messages, my email, or my family system, or anything, right? Health, you name it, kind of thing. And it's urgent as urgent can be. Do you have those, right? Like it's happening, it's on now, and we're rallying the troops. And I realize that some, oftentimes to those prayer requests, some resolution will come, and I don't even, re I barely remember what the, and it was just a few days ago, and I'm like, what? And I realize over and over and over again, in the hurry and in the velocity, that even things that I personally have prayed for and care about, with people that I love or care about or Costa Rica team that's in who knows where and on and on it goes, in the velocity of it all, I forget, oh, wait a second, God did something there. Do you ever get that? Kind of have that thing where you realize, oh my gosh, wait, wait a second, like something really urgent, God did something about it. He moved, he answered, he changed things. Oh, yeah. When, when was that again? When, so in the flow of all of this, I realized that at least in my life, with the hurry factor and with the velocity factor, I, I don't know that I forget. I just kind of keep flying through life and don't remember. And so for me this morning, as we talk about kind of the way that the Psalms and the wisdom literature form us, I want us to pause. And we've structured really the whole service. You can already see the communion tables here. We've structured the whole service around really remembering. Remembering who God is, remembering his greatness, remembering his goodness, remembering how he moves. Because there is something that forms us deeply when we remember him. There, there's something that, that connects us to him when we remember his greatness and his goodness. There's something that, that grows our faith. There's something that anchors our hope. There's something that increases our capacity for love when we remember him. And so this morning we're gonna, we're gonna remember him. You, you've already remembered him if you listened to Psalm 145 and as you participated along. So this morning, let, let, let's remember him, okay? Let's go back, we'll, we're in Psalm 145 and, and we're gonna look here about, we're gonna remember as David kind of walks us through this psalm here, this great writing here, we're gonna remember God's greatness. We're gonna just start there, greatness and goodness. That's, that's what we're gonna hit this morning and then we're gonna celebrate Break this. Okay, so in, in the greatness, I think we have this on the slide, and we pulled up verses four through through, through seven here, and we'll pull up, we'll look at ten through thirteen in, in a minute here as well. But but in, in this particular sec, so yeah, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. So four four through seven would be great. I think that that slide. In four through seven here, we, we have the, these declarations of, of God's greatness, and I want you to to tune your thing, tune your ears to a couple different things. The, the first one is this. God's greatness to his people through the pen or the lips or the mind of David is attached to what he has actually done. Pause there for a second. Stay with me here for a second, okay? Sometimes we in the West think of God's greatness as a concept. It's a theological premise or underpinning. It is philosophical, it is lofty, it is elusive, it is ethereal. Not here. Not here. It doesn't mean that it's not that. It doesn't mean that we ought to think grand thoughts about God and his ways, but they are anchored here. God's greatness is anchored to what he has already done. Do you see the importance of that? Like, he did this stuff. <laughs> He is this person who did this stuff right here. And there's this huge body of work that he has in the Old Testament to which, of course, the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints would appeal. In fact, David doesn't really get real specific. So what's intrigued me as I looked at the, at the greatness of God here is the way that David described it. And I had to do a weird thing in my head because I'm weird. So I had, to, I had to look at this and think, okay, I want to look at the modifiers because I'm so fascinated about this. So, so look, for example, at verse 4. God's, act, my, you declare your mighty acts. And so I just went backwards. 
God's acts are mighty. And I just did that through the section here. Verse 5, God's majesty is just overflowing with glorious splendor. His works, verse 5, is, are wondrous. His might, his, excuse me, his deeds are awesome. His greatness is worthy of declaration. Verse 7, he, he, that your goodness is abundant. Your righteousness, I just want to sing from the rooftop, right? That over and over and over again, God's greatness is just kind of unfathomable in one sense, and yet these works are real things that he actually did. So, for example, <laughs> We've rehearsed this a number of different times. Their very existence as a people came from a childless couple that God spoke to with no prior context, at least in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 11 and 12. And he speaks to them and he says, Abraham, you're 75, Sarah, you're 65, Sarah, yes, you're beyond the change, and so here we go. And by the way, your descendants will be as the sands of the seashore and the stars of the heaven. And so I'm going to bless you and make a great nation, and off we go. And so their very existence as a people is due to the fact that God's mighty acts and deeds came to this childless couple, and now off we go with their story. The descendants get enslaved in Egypt. God makes them mighty. They grow. God delivers them from the hand of the most powerful person on earth. And many of us know the story that they walk through the Red Sea on dry land, and it just keeps going right? And all of this is now in the collective memory of the people, of the nation. So much so that the festivals point to many of these things, and the big festival is Passover, because this is what God did, and this is how we walked out, and this is who we are as a people, and that's, children, why we live here, as they would celebrate in the promised land. God's deeds, his Acts, his works are mighty, and we can see them, David would say. Just think, thinking about this as we were, we were kind of walking through this and doing some teaching team stuff. Actually, a couple weeks ago when Ryan taught, um, and, we, and we hosted Bridge Builders, and, and Ryan taught out of Psalm 96, right? And we talked about the nations and God, God's heart for the nations. And as we were chatting about that, uh, kind of in, in ramping up, we, we, we stood and kind of were just in awe for a minute about a couple things that are obvious once you say them out loud, but sometimes they can get lost. They're, they're hard to remember sometimes. Maybe I'll just say it like that. We just sang it in Holy Forever. A thousand generations falling down in worship will sing a song of ages to the Lamb. Just think about that. A thousand generations. <laughs> thousand generations. See, all this time and all these time zones away, the good news of Jesus got to us. Now, last time I checked, I don't know anybody, I could, could be wrong about this, but I don't know anybody who speaks Koine Greek as a first language or Aramaic or ancient Hebrew. You may have learned it, you may have studied it, you may have, but probably that wasn't your first language, especially since a couple of them are dead. But anyways, so that's, that's probably true. And yet, right, the, the good news of Jesus, the, the good news from this ragtag bunch of people who all deserted Jesus in the crushing pressure of the cross, but then Jesus comes and he appears to them and 500 people, Paul says, and so that's the seedbed of this fledgling little movement that has no resources, no power, no political anything. They don't have any person in the Senate working for them. They don't have any, we just go down the list and somehow this thing explodes and it gets all these time zones and all, these t all this time away. How does this happen? The greatness of God, right? Like it happened. And so we want to remember God's magnificent greatness 
in his deeds, in his acts, in how this happened. This got to us in our language, all this distance away. And God opened our heart and we saw the beauty of Jesus. And all of you have stories like that. You may have grown up in a home where you never didn't know Jesus. You may, have known, you may not even quite know Jesus, but here you are on a Sunday morning at nine o'clock, right? That changed your Saturday nights, and off we go and everything in between. God has done something unimaginable, right? In the good news and in the good news that is following in solidarity with all the good news that came before us. He's great, and so David says, remember God's greatness. Anchor yourselves, tether yourselves to that greatness. Remember the richness, the majesty, the magnitude, the awe and that you're living in that story. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to practice this. <laughs> we're going to practice some remembering this morning. We're going to re remember this. So I don't have the courage to do this. I kind of wish I did, that we could do this corporately, but we're not. So we're just going to pause and be quiet. I want to give you a moment before God to remember his greatness, to remember the great things that he's actually done. You have your own list. But I want to just give you a moment. We're just going to have just a minute, minute and a half maybe, for you to pause and talk to God about his greatness and declare back to him the great things that you know he's actually done. Okay? I'll be quiet. Let's pray. So, Father, hear us as we say back to you your greatness. Greatness that we have seen. Greatness that we are in solidarity with. Greatness that, that is thousands of years before us. Greatness that includes thousands of generations. <laughs> greatness that reached this incredible crescendo in the death and the resurrection of Jesus who conquered and crushed death and abolished it forever. And so, Father, we celebrate, we remember that you, you, you are great and your deeds are mighty and awesome and we can see them. And so we thank you for that. Amen. Well, we're going to continue our little practice here you guys, because we're celebrating and remembering God's greatness with David in, in the psalm, and we continue on because I think David kind of makes, you know, this is probably grossly oversimplified, but ind indulge me, I'm a simple man, and so he, he moves from the God's greatness into kind of a section that is a little bit more of a, a, what I would call his goodness. We, we pick up the text, for example, in, in verses 14 through 17, I think, is where, maybe 18, and so, yeah, here we go. So, the Lord upholds those who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. So, all these mighty acts, right, that are big and global and national and et cetera, et cetera, right? Every, all these people. Now it becomes, wow, so there are people, there are people who are falling and, and bowed down. The eyes of all, oops, here we go. Eyes of all look to you, thank you. Yeah, and give their, you give them their food in due season. So now God is feeding people and caring and this is what theologians call God's providential care of the world. You open your hand, you satisfy their desire of every link. This is goodness upon goodness upon goodness. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. And verse 18 continues, the Lord is near to all who call on him, on, to all who call on him in truth. So the operative word, the connecting word in all of, of that goodness as God displays it in the lives of people is near. See, sometimes I think when we think about God's greatness, at least for me, it's really easy to think of something that is very distant. 
And by extension, God becomes that. He's austere, and he's running the world, and he's incomprehensible, and he's all these omnis, right? That in one sense, I kind of get, and in another sense, I don't get really get at all. And, and so I can get lost, in a sense, in his greatness, and because of that, his distance, that, 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 that he is high and lifted up. And it is high and lifted up. He's like, where, where, where is he? And all of a sudden, David flips without any kind of a violent transition, really, into God's goodness. And all of a sudden, God, in his majesty, in his greatness, and also in his goodness, is really close. So the Lord is near to all who call on him. He's right here. He is closer to us than our breath is to us. He's always here. And as Paul said on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, in him we live and move and have our being. That everyone and everywhere and all, all the things that live, live because of God. You and I have breath in our lungs. Take a breath. That came from God, right? Every moment, in every, in every, every moment and every day came from God. And in all of that distance and all of that majesty and all of that magnitude and all of that far awayness and all that awesomeness, he is at the same time close. We've rehearsed, I know, a number of different times in here the theme verse for what we're walking through on Wednesday nights. I promise I'm not I'm trying to sell Wednesday nights. It's obviously having an impact on me, okay? Can I just say that? And so I've loved the theme verses for this be, for forever and ever. They were, you know, I don't know when I memorized them or whatever, but they were easy to memorize, right? That Jesus is this kind of a person, Right where he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am, this is the, his own self-description, gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for yourselves. Okay, God Almighty is gentle and humble in heart. D do you see the beauty and the magnitude of who he is? That Jesus got down on the ground. And so as we rehearse God's greatness and his goodness, we rehearse the fact that, that Jesus, God the Son, became Jesus of Nazareth and took on a human body and the Christmas story happened, right? And in the Christmas story happened, Jesus died a real death in order to conquer it with his indestructible life. And so in all of that goodness, God, God is near. You probably have some near stories, right? These stories go, go all over the place. I, usually, it, usually they come when we come to those places that we see over and over again in the Gospels as people interact with Jesus, where G people just got on their face. People like to call it a posture of desperation. But we see it lots of different places, right? You've got a, a royal official son who comes and says, my little daughter's dying. He's 12-ish. Jairus is his name. And so he comes and he loses all of his Eastern dignity in an honor and shame culture to put himself on his face before this traveling itinerant rabbi because he's the only one left who can do something. And so he embraces all of that shame and humiliation. Culturally, it would have been massive in order to plead with Jesus to heal her. And we've all had moments somewhere in that family, right? Where it's time to lose your dignity. <laughs> it's time to lose protocol. It's time to lose having it all together. It's time to lose being the solution to your old pro um, problems. It's time to lose being an alpha. It's time to lose making it happen. It's time to lose your degrees. It's time to lose all of you and me in front of him. Because only he can do something. And so you have those moments. Those moments probably include how you even got here in the first place. I, I've rehearsed this all the time. What God did to get the good news to me in a way that I could hear it. 
I just I think about the guys that he brought into my life. I think about being a high school kid and my buddy Dwayne bringing Jesus to me. And Dwayne knew enough to know how to do this or whatever. And so lo and behold, we find ourselves at a fellowship of Christian athletes, week-long thing. And I'm, on, I'm literally at the back end of that on my face. I'm undone by unconditional love. Undone. Like, I, I, I'm just, I'm literally weeping. I've lost all the dignity at the ripe old age of 16 years on all these knuckleheads I didn't even know, but I'm like, I'm just, I'm done. I'm just lost in this. And I got lost a few more times or whatever, and so God sends my buddy Dave into my life. And Dave was involved with crew at UCLA, and he had come to faith in Jesus, and so, so he, we, we'd gone to high school together, and I have no idea literally to this day how he knew that I existed because we were a couple years together, and it's like, Anyway, but he knew I existed somehow, and he knew I was UCLA, and I have no idea. No interweb back in the day, but anyway, that, I digress. And so he walk, he's meeting with the campus director for crew. He's a student. This guy's a staff guy. And so the staff guy says, I'm tired of ta- talking about all this stuff. Who in these fraternity things or whatever do you want to talk to? And so I was on Dave's list, and so they get up. Now, if you're familiar with UCLA, if you speak UCLA, this is way back in the day. They're in Ackerman Union. They're in the student union, okay? And so they got to walk by a lot of territory to get to the west side of campus to my fraternity. So they did. And I've thought a thousand, maybe not a thousand times, 500 times probably, how many turns Dave could have taken before he got to my fraternity room. He could have thought, he probably thought right there, this is a stupid idea. It's a Wednesday in the middle of the afternoon. Well, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. And so they could have turned off at Pauley Pavilion. Yeah, you know. They could have turned off at the intramural field. How about Drake Stadium right there? Oh, here's all the dorms or whatever. Oh, you know, my fraternity is just down this way on Gailey, so I don't think we're going to do that. Now they schlep all the way over. Hey, I'm looking for a guy named Steve Osborne. And so all of that, because God had done so much in Dave and Don's life, that they walked all the way through. God was near to them, and he became near to me through them. And on the story goes. You have some places where God drew near. Moments where he healed. Moments where he changed things. Moments where he gave you perspective. Moments when you came before him and you say, God, I don't see any solutions, and he delivered you. Do you have those moments in there too? Well, let's remember those moments, can we? So let's pause and kind of do what we just did. Just a minute or so for you to remember before God his nearness to you. Because even though, even though he is great, he is also just as good <laughs> and near to us. Let's pause and remember here's nearness. And so, Father, hear hear us as we remember you. We remember your nearness. We remember the moments. We remember when you met us. You may remember all the different ways that you have met us. We remember your nearness. And we say thank you to you because you are great and you are good. And dare we say it, Lord, you are ours and we are yours. And so we remember you this morning. Amen. Well, there's a final remembrance that we are going to have here in a minute as we celebrate, celebrate the table. But uh, I, I was thinking, you know, I, I, I just, there's, there's, sometimes it's helpful for me to kind of connect some dots, okay, and ask, ask some questions. So remembering God, remember his, remembering his greatness, remembering his goodness, what, is, like, what does this do? 
why this is a psalm in which we are encouraged, in effect, to, to do this. And so what is God after as is, is he, is he does this? And so I just want to, again, I'm a simple guy. And so I just want to maybe a couple, three things, really, that I see that really form us as we remember God's greatness and his goodness. Maybe not necessarily in those languages, but we just pause the relentless hurry, the constant velocity to remember what it is that he is doing and has done. So, so a couple different things. I, I think, well, I'll think about faith, hope, and love, okay? Faith, hope, and love. That ought to be somewhat Memorable. I mentioned Abraham earlier today, as right? The, the Jewish people understood that they had come from this grand story of God. And, and the story not just included God's miraculous work in Abraham and Sarah, but also his, what he was going to do through them as a people, ultimately in and through Jesus, as, as he, if with all the, through whom he would bless all the families of, of the earth. But in, in Paul, telling Paul's story, or in telling Abraham's story in, in Romans chapter four, Paul, Paul says this: "In hope against hope, he believed, in order that may, he might become a father of many nations." And then he begins this description here at the back end of Romans chapter chapter four. He said, "And without growing weak in faith, he that is Abraham contemplated his own body." Now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. No offense, Abraham, right? Yeah. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. In other words, there's no way but God, right, is where they are at in God's economy. Yet, he said, Paul writes, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to deliver. Okay, now do you see, do you see that? So somehow in all of that, God actually grows our faith through these things that we beg him to remove. <laughs> not always. Some, we live in a war zone, for crying out loud. But in Abraham's case, God used it in this mighty way to grow our faith. So one of the things in remembering God's greatness and his goodness is that God is growing us. And apparently faith is something like, well, many people have seen this metaphor in Scripture, it's something like muscles or something, right? It can grow. I mean, intellect, you know, other things can grow too. But it's something then when exercised, and perhaps we might dare say only through exercise does it grow. In other words, God is not just a concept. He's someone to walk with through the journey and learn how to trust, and in that, our faith grows. How about hope? The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 6, this hope, that is the hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus and the good news of Jesus, this hope we have is an anchor for our souls. And so what God does is we, we, we remember his greatness and his goodness, what he's done in history, what he's done in our life, is that God grows at that anchor of our hope. In other words, it becomes more secure, not less. That he secures it. As we walk with him and we remember his greatness and his goodness, oh yeah, the hope is sure. It's secure. Other things are a lot less sure, sure right? They, they, they can go. And we have stories, the longer we go on, of things that went, health that went, bank accounts that went, families that went. Sad, right? It's sad. And so the hope, the security is that anchor for our soul and then love. Many for generations have written about how God forms us in relationship so that he increases amazingly our capacity to love him and to love others. And as we remember his greatness and his goodness, he's, he, he's just increasing our capacity for, to, to, to love him and, and to love him for who he is. And many of the ancient writers have talked about this, these incredible levels of love where we come to this place where we love God simply for who he is, not, wait for it, for what he gives us. We love him for who he is, not just for his gifts. 
and that high, beautiful, majestic kind of love is part of what God is doing as he expands us as we remember his greatness and his goodness and he takes us on this incredible journey of being expanded. I was thinking about this as Debbie and I are new grandparents. And so we're thinking about the amazing way in families. Do you, do you see this and feel this? Where God seemingly miraculously, maybe it's not a miracle, that's probably overstating it, but God expands your capacity to love. You add people that you love about and you love, and it's not like I don't love, I, I had to take from, love from you and put it over here. It doesn't work that way, does it? It, it? it doesn't. It's not like, okay, I have X amount of love, and so I'm going to cut, I'm going to shave a little here, I'm going to cut here or whatever too, and oh, okay, yeah, all right, yeah. I, and you, you get six, whatever six is, right? It's like, I, I, no, God expands our capacity to love, and it's this wonderful, beautiful thing about love. And as we walk with him and remember his greatness and his goodness, he does the same thing in our life. That he grows our faith, that he anchors our hope, that he expands our capacity to love him and to love other people. And so on the velocity, <laughs> let's join and remember and pause and celebrate his greatness and his goodness. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table together, and I'm going to welcome the worship team back up and we're going to take a moment to do this, and many of you know this, but I just want to read from the words of Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as he instructs the church at Corinth about celebrating God's table because it has our word in it. Verse 23 of chapter 11. It says this, For I see, received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it, he said, This is my body, which is for you. Now you know the rest of the words if you've been around for a little while. Do this in what? Remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is Jesus who took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often, Paul writes, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In other words, this remembrance of thing Jesus built into the meal that celebrates what it is that he has done. And so as we go, we want to receive the elements and remember God's greatness. <laughs> that this amazing thing that he has done was all his idea. That God the Son became a man, walked among us, died on a cross, and rose from the dead so that you and I could be in relationship with him. That he is not only great, but Jesus is near. He touched people. He talked to people. He cared about people. He raised people up when they were in the dirt in front of him, pleading with him. He is great, and he is unimaginably good, and he's ours, you guys. Huh. He's ours because of what he's done as he welcomes us in. So let me pray for us. I'm going to invite you to take the elements. You just come back and get with whoever you would like to be with as well and celebrate those elements as you remember, again, for the third time, his greatness and his goodness. Let's pray. And so, Father, we come before you to remember. To remember, Jesus, your greatness. We've already sung it. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are holy forever. And you are good. You are near. You are near to the brokenhearted. And it is in and through and because of you that we have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And so as we come to the table, Jesus, we remember your body and your blood was shed for us. Thank you, Jesus, for being great and for being good and for being ours. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to go and receive the elements.